Father God, I do thank you so much for your word. I thank you that we have the opportunity to be able to open it. I thank you that every time we come to your word, that we can expect to hear from you. It's active and it's living and it's sharp and it penetrates our soul and it reaches down in and it confronts us on things that we don't want to be confronted on and it speaks to matters that we don't often want to even think about or deal with, Lord, and that's the beauty of being able to hear your word and be able to preach through and see and going verse by verse, seeing exactly how you have spoken to mankind. And so I do pray that's exactly what you'll do today. That you'll get me out of the way and that you will show up and that because of it, people will be able to walk out of this place different than having come because your word is transformative. We thank you. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so I hate to bring this up because I know it was such a hard time for so many. And so many people had a very difficult experience with this time. And, but we are in September. And so I have to ask the question leading into this sermon. You'll see where we're going with it. But how many of you remember where you were on 9-11? Okay, most of you, right? The crazy thing to think about is I just did a wedding yesterday for a couple. And I know for a fact that one of them wasn't born. Like, or they were just, no, that's not true. There were two. There were two. I had done a wedding this summer, though, where I know some of them weren't born. Neither of them were born. And so it's crazy to think about, September 11th. And so it was crazy, though, wasn't it? Because everything about that day, it was a normal day. You have this September day, and inside of this, everything changed, didn't it? Everything changed. The way we saw the world changed. The way we as Americans changed. And it was a absolute change in our culture. And we saw that, we felt that for a while. And these are the pictures that we saw over and over again, right? We saw this over and over. We saw this one with the plane. I can still remember seeing that. We saw this view and it's just, it changed everything. Everything about it. It interrupted our day. It it just changed the way we saw things. We saw the explosions that took place. This is wild to even look at and think back to that day. And I just, I remember it. I remember it so well. I remember these pictures where we recognize that these are our citizens, right? Do you remember how you felt? One thing to remember where you were. Do you remember how you felt? Some people were afraid. Some people were afraid and angry. And some people were just confused. Like, how could this happen? How could we as Americans, how could we have our lives interrupted and changed in such a way? I remember these pictures. We remember the first responders and how for years after that, everybody looked up to them and valued them and cherished them. And we saw the kind of things that they were asked to do. And so we saw our first responders in a completely different way. And I remember pictures like this, right, where it demonstrates and it shows exactly where we were as a nation. You see the flag and you see it still flying, but it's damaged and it's worn because it's been through some stuff. And we were going through some stuff as a nation. And then I remember this, don't you? Because that changed everything when they put a face to it. And I remember being in school. And I can admit this, I was pretty young myself, right? I was, I think I was in middle school at the time, uh, somewhere around there, middle school. And I can remember not reacting to this well. When we found out who it was, I can remember, and I went to a Christian school, I can remember sitting next to my friends and we were just so mad and we were so angry about what had happened. And then when they finally put a name to what happened to us, everybody was so angry. He was like public enemy number one, wasn't he? For years, it's all you heard about. No matter what you were listening to on the news, eventually they would mention his name, whether they were searching for him or whether they thought they might know which direction he was in. Whatever it was, his name showed up all the time. And I remember as a middle schooler doing dumb things that middle schoolers do. I remember talking to my friend and we were like, if we were in charge, this is what we came up with. Now, okay, we are all broken humans, all right? So don't hold this against me. This was our punishment we came up with as middle school Ben and his middle school friends. We're like, if we were in charge and we found him, we'd put him on two motorcycles and send him in different directions. That was our plan. We're like, that'll do it. That'll do it, right? That's middle schoolers in our minds. We're like, yeah. Like, first of all, it's motorcycles, which is awesome. And then as a kid, you're like, yeah, I'll just send him in two ways. It'll be crazy, right? That's what we were. That's where we were. And so I bring up something so hard, and I bring up something so um, near and dear to our hearts, because I think the story that we're going in today, this narrative that we're in, involving Saul, uh, we often glance over it, because so many of us know it so well. We've heard it all of our lives. 
We've heard about Saul our whole lives. We know the story. We get to know the ending. And so the beginning doesn't carry the weight that it should. Because for us, we're like, yeah, we know Saul, but wait till later. But that's, so it loses so much of its power because we know the end. But they, those that were living through this, they didn't know the end of it, right? They felt a lot like we did with Osama bin Laden. Saul, he's public enemy number one. Saul, he's going around and he's destroying people. We see that in Acts 9. That's a chapter we're going to be in. But you know, we bounce around a lot, but we're going to be in Acts 9 today. And it says, but Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priests. If he's still breathing threats, what does that mean he was doing before? We see that interaction that we went through with Stephen a few weeks back in Acts 7, 58 through 60. Then they cast him out of the city and they stoned him. This is Stephen. And the witnesses laid down their garments at the feet of a young man named Saul. And as they were stoning Stephen, he called out, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And falling to his knees, he cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. And so that idea of why, why Saul, why was he holding these coats? What was going on here? So in Deuteronomy 17, 6 through 7, it explains some law that gives you an idea of what was going on in this situation, all right? So on the evidence of two witnesses, so you would have had witnesses that were making these accusations against Stephen, right? So on the evidence of two witnesses or of three witnesses, the one who is to die, that's Stephen, shall be put to death. A person shall not be put to death on the evidence of one witness, for obvious reasons. Verse 7, the hand of the witnesses shall be first against him to put him to death, and afterward the hand of all the people. So you shall purge the evil from your midst. So if this is being done correctly, according to the law, what they would have done was, after Stephen was pronounced guilty, if it wasn't just a mob rule, them coming in and killing him because of anger, which it may well have been, but if it was done the correct way, according to the Jewish law, what they would have done was the two witnesses would have gone first. So they would have brought his, their cloaks to him, and they would have given them to Saul. Because the cloak that they're talking about, it's not like they're like, okay, we got to stone this guy. we got to strip down. That's not what's going on. They would wear an outer garment. And that outer garment was very important in their culture. In fact, it was so important that you were not allowed to sue somebody and keep it overnight. Because your outer garment was considered a right that a person had. Because it was not only used as a jacket to stay warm during the day, but it was also often used to keep warm at night. So it would be the equivalent of stealing somebody's coat in Buffalo. Not cool, right? It's not something you do. So they wouldn't allow you to even sue to take that and keep it overnight. And so what's happening is they're bringing their jacket. And this would have been valuable. This is a valuable possession. And they're bringing it over and they're giving it to Saul because they don't want any blood on their jacket, which is ironic because they seem to be okay with having blood on their hands, but not on their jacket. And so they take them and they bring them over and they give them to Saul. And so Saul is holding these and it says that Saul looks on and he gives credence to the things that are happening. He's good with what's happening to Stephen. And so the introduction of Saul that we're meeting here in chapter 9 cannot be overlooked because we know Saul. And so we're like, oh, Saul, yeah, but years later, he's super nice. Right now, he said, this coat is worth more than Stephen. That's who we're dealing with. That's the introduction we get with Saul. These coats, they're worth more to me than the life of this Christian because he is blaspheming God. That was his perspective. And so we're building up Saul as public enemy number one as we drive in towards where we're headed today. And we see the next introduction of Saul, Acts 8, 1 through 3. And Saul approved of his execution. And there arose on that day a great persecution against the church in Jerusalem, and they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judah and Samaria, except the apostles. Devout men buried Stephen and made great lamentation over him. But Saul, here we go again, he was ravaging the church. And entering house after house, he dragged off men and women and committed them to prison. 
So you can imagine, he has the authority of the high priest. He's carrying with him these letters so he can really get away with whatever he wants. And so he's breaking into these houses. He says, we're going to see next, he's going into synagogues and he's taking these people that won't deny Jesus and he's bringing them and he's taking them into jail to await their sentencing of what's going to happen. That's who Saul was. This is his own words when he talks about his own work. I myself was convinced, this is Acts 26, 9 through 10. I myself was convinced that I ought to do many things in opposing the name of Jesus of Nazareth. And I did so in Jerusalem. I not only locked up many of the saints in prison after receiving authority from the chief priests, but when they were put to death, I cast my vote against them. And there's some argument about what the casting of the vote means. I'll read this to you from uh, Tom Constable. I love his stuff. He does really good work, and he explains what that cast my lot could mean. Cast my vote may be metaphorical or less likely literal. There is no evidence that Paul was ever a member of the Sanhedrin, but he could have voted to punish Christians in the lower courts, such as the ones that existed in local synagogues. Or he could have been an accredited agent of the Sanhedrin empowered to vote. Or he could have been a member of the Sanhedrin. Some scholars believe that Paul may have been elected into the Sanhedrin after Stephen's martyrdom, possibly as a reward for his zeal against Christians, but there's no solid evidence for this. So when they set up Paul, there's two different things. There's two different options. Either he is literally going in and he's taking these men and women and he brings them to court, and then when it's time to vote, he votes, yes, kill them. Or at the very least, he's doing that. He's taking the men and women and he's bringing them in. And when they are voted on to be killed because they will not denounce Jesus, he's good with it. He's like, yes, I approve of this. And he's there in some way giving his approval. Either way, Paul explains further, I punished them often in the synagogues and I tried to make them blaspheme. This is who he was. He tried to get them to renounce Jesus. That was his mission. And he was either going to make you renounce Jesus or he was going to see through that you ended up losing your life. That's who Saul was. And in raging fury against them, I persecuted them even to foreign cities. And so you see how, who Saul was. And so, so many people would have known who Saul was. So many people would have known that he's the one who he went after and he was there and he approved of Stephen's death. And there would have been people that knew Saul, that saw what he had done in bringing women and children and men and taking them into prison and breaking up families and voting for their death or at least approving of their death. So, so many people would have had stories of who this Saul was. And so we romanticize it sometimes of, yes, Saul, well, he was bad for a little while. He was on a mission. He was public enemy number one. He was to Christians what Osama bin Laden was to us on 9-11. Because it sets the stage totally different when we actually begin to see who he really was. So that brings us back to where we are today, Acts chapter 9. So still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, he went to the high priest And he asked him for letters to the synagogues at Damascus. So that if he found any belonging to the way, that's a reference to Christianity, the way, that's what they called it then, men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. And so now you see Saul, he's literally, he's going, this would have been about 150 miles. And you're like, that's not that big of a deal. He can drive that really fast. The average person traveled about 20 miles a day. So for eight mornings, he woke up going, I'm going to kill me some Christians. Can you imagine being angry eight mornings in a row like that to the point that you're like, yep, I'm doing the Lord's work. I'm waking up and I'm still pursuing them for eight straight days, eight days of travel. You wake up with this hate in your heart to see Christians come to ruin. That's who Saul is. And I thought about that. He's traveling eight days to get to these Christians here. In, um, in, in Damascus, it only, took, it, was, uh, it only took 14 hours by plane to get from Afghanistan to the United States. And so we think about Osama bin Laden and them coming so far to come here and try to destroy us. Saul was traveling eight days rather than just 14 hours. 
And so Saul is known all over this place. Because if he's coming all the way to Damascus, that means most likely, it says that I've traveled, he traveled outside of Jerusalem to foreign places to go after Christians. That means he's going place to place to place. He's done this before. Now he's eight days journey away. This is who Saul is before we meet him and before Jesus, more importantly, meets him here in Acts 9. Now, as he went on his way, he approached Damascus. That means he almost got all the way there. So eight days in, right? He's approaching Damascus. And suddenly a light from heaven shone around to him. And falling to the ground, he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But rise and enter the city, and you will be told what you are to do. The men who were traveling with him stood speechless, hearing the voice but seeing no one. Saul rose from the ground, and although his eyes were opened, he saw nothing. So they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. And for three days he was without sight, and he neither ate nor drank. And so you have this crazy experience. And so right here we can see that who Saul was. Can you imagine even wanting, honestly, as Christians who we were, and seeing what had been done, can you even imagine wanting Osama bin Laden have come to Jesus at that time? That wasn't on my mind. I remember people, some people preached that. I remember somebody saying that. Like God can even reach him. And if we're honest, part of me was like, let's not though. Like, yeah, he can, but let's maybe not. Because of what he's done, who he is, what he, what he has done to us, how he has hurt us. And so even with Saul, I can see so many people feeling the same way. Because of all the things that he had done, what he was known for, his reputation, the destruction that he brought on the church. And so if God can reach him, what does that mean for the people that we know? Because I think the longer we go about being Christians, the more people that we have in our sphere of influence, the more that we have shared with people, the longer and the more years we see that we share with them, we try to be a good influence with them, and that they continually stay away from and they reject this idea of Christianity. I think there's a lot of us that in our own lives, we have counted people out. In our mind, no way. Not them. Right? You have people that you know that in your mind you're like, yeah, I mean, if God wanted to, I guess. But in our minds, we've counted them out because of who they are, the reputation that they have. We have this song that we sing that oh, pretty much everybody knows, even in the secular world, most people know the song Amazing Grace. And it opens, Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now am found, was blind, but now I see. And so the writer of this says at a young age, John Newton went to sea. And like most sailors of his day, he lived a life of rebellion and debauchery. For several years, he worked on slave ships, capturing slaves for sale to the plantations of the new world. So low did he sink that at one point, he became a slave himself, captive of another slave trader. Eventually, he became the captain of his own slave ship. The combination of a frightening storm at sea coupled with his reading of Thomas A. Kempis, classic imitation of Christ, planted the seeds that resulted in his conversion. He went on to become a leader in the evangelical movement in 18th century England, along with such men as John and Charles Wesley, George Whitfield, and William Wilberforce. On his tombstone is inscribed the following epitaph, written by Newton himself. John Newton, clerk, once an infidel and libertine, a servant of slaver, slavers in Africa, was, by the rich mercy of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, preserved, restored, pardoned, and appointed to preach the faith he had long labored to destroy. When he penned the beloved hymn, Amazing Grace, he knew firsthand the truths it proclaimed. And so when we sing that song, Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now am found, was blind, but now I see. Who in our own lives have we counted out with the gospel? Because I know I've done that in my own mind. Not that I've thought it's impossible for God, but that I've kind of just said, that's who they are. This is where they're at. And I don't see it happening. 
It's so easy to do. I was talking to somebody recently, and the, the way that we talked about somebody, I could tell in their own mind that this guy in their mind was gone. It was, it was a lost cause. And I think we do that too often, not recognizing that if God can save somebody like Saul, then who is out of his reach if he's going to be the one that pursues them? The second question is, are you willing to reach Saul? Because that's one thing. It's one thing to say, okay, fine. I hope, I hope uh, somebody like Osama bin Laden, I hope an enemy, I hope somebody who's offended me, I hope that they will come to know Jesus. It's another thing to be willing to reach out to them. And we all have people in our own lives that are our enemies in many ways, right? The way they treat us, the way they've made us feel, the way they described us, the way maybe they've humiliated us. And so think about where Ananias is in this whole situation. Acts chapter 9, starting in verse 10. It says, now there was a disciple at Damascus named Ananias. So where was Saul going to kill Christians at? Damascus, right? So where in relationship is Ananias to Saul? Are they bros? Probably not. Not friends, right? And so this is who you have, the person that Saul, what person that would have been on his list of people that he's coming and he's coming to destroy. This disciple at Damascus named Ananias. And the Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias. And he said, here I am, Lord. And the Lord said to him, rise and go to the street called Straight. And at the house of Judas, look for a man of Tarsus named Saul. For behold, he is praying. And he has seen in a vision a man named Ananias come in and lay hands on him so that he might regain his sight. And if you're Ananias, you're like, man, he got blind Saul. I'd love to lay hands on him right around his neck and just squeeze a little bit, right? It's the, not the kind of laying hands you're talking here. And Ananias, look at him. He knows Saul's reputation. But Ananias answered, first of all, I love the irony in him telling God who this guy is, right? He's like, but Ananias answered, Lord, I've heard uh, from many about this man, how much evil he has done to your saints at Jerusalem. And he's like, and uh, here, he has authority from the chief priests to bind all who call on your name. And so Ananias is like, great idea, Lord. But you do know who we're talking about, right? Like we, we're talking about the same guy. Maybe it's another Saul of Tarsus, and that's who's praying. And so think about the situation that he's in. He's being asked to go rescue somebody he knows the reputation of. This man is coming to kill him. And God is saying he's in a vulnerable place right now. I need you to go, I need you to speak to him. And I thought about that, and I thought, would I be willing to do this? Would I be willing to talk to my enemy? Would I be willing to go reach my own personal Saul? Is that something I'd be willing to do? 1 Corinthians 6, 9 through 11, do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you, but you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ by the Spirit of our God. And so what's happening is what we have to be open to as a church is if we, if you and I, if we are doing our job, if we are reaching the people that God has called us to reach, if we are reaching the lost and we are reaching the broken and we're going to the hopeless and we're going out and we're sharing with them the gospel and the people that come into our lives and the people that are down in the dumb set, they're looking for hope and they're looking for an answer and we get the opportunity to share share with them Jesus, are we okay with Saul's coming into our church? Because for so many de decades, I believe, a lot of churches weren't okay with that. Somebody would come in and they'd sit down, and we're in a small town. And so somebody would be like, hey, yeah, you know who that is? Yeah, of course I know who that is. There's 17 people in Wyoming. How do I not know them, right? <laughs> like, yeah, of course I know who that is. And it's like, don't you know who they've been? Yeah. That's been the history of church in many small towns, in many small communities. 
And so as I'm thinking through this and I'm reading through this and I'm thinking, God, everybody knows this story. Everybody sees this story. We know that it's amazing that you took Saul and you brought him, you changed him into Paul. And then when you start to think about it, though, you're asking Ananias to go to Paul before Paul is proven to be Paul. That's different, isn't it? Now I have to trust the work that God has done in their heart. And so what do I do when someone comes into our own church or someone comes into our life and we know their reputation, we know who they are, we know what they've been, and they're in the moment, they're in this moment, and they've had this experience with Jesus, and they, they know him, but they just got saved. Are we good with them coming into church? Because I think too often we were looking for somebody to come into church, done, Right? It's like, okay, we need them, and we need them a finished product, and then it'll be great to have it in our church as part of our fellowship. I wonder how many of us would have accepted Saul. Because honestly, it'd be tough, wouldn't it? You're like, wait, Saul, the guy is murdering Christians, and he just wants to come into our church? We're for sure getting murdered. Right? We'd feel that way. I thought about that, though. Are we going to be the kind of people that the single mother can come to you and she can say, I know I've been doing something. I know I've been living in sin, but I recognize this and I see Jesus for who he is. And I'm trying to, I want to follow him. Are we okay with being her friend? Because we, oh yeah, of course we would. But so often we don't. We treat them as if, okay, you prove it first. And once you prove it, I'll put up with you. It's like when somebody comes in and somebody's like, do you see what they're wearing? Or somebody comes in and they have a hat on. They're like, can you believe they're coming to church with a hat? Yeah, I'm glad they came to church at all. If they're, in the, if they're in pursuit of Christ, we should honestly be in pursuit of them. But so many of us are really afraid to deal with somebody who's, yeah, they might be Paul, but they haven't proved it yet. And don't you know that they were, they were addicted to drugs and it hasn't been that long since they've said they've been clean. So maybe we should just wait on this. We treat people so weird. We expect, I mean, don't we remember who we were? How do we expect somebody to go just one day switch and know everything? To have the same background, the same values that you had in one day. But we do that to people. We do that to people. When I was teaching youth group, I, I always said I had three rules. And my youth group kids know my three rules very well. Don't get murdered, because that's a lot of paperwork. Don't get kidnapped, that's worse. And don't make purple. Gr boys are blue, girls are pink, I don't want to see purple. Those are my three rules. And I always said that because, you know, like, hey, Ben, that seems like a pretty simple list of rules. It was because anything else, whoever came in there, whatever it was, whatever it looked like, whether they didn't know enough not to swear in youth group, I'm okay with it. I've heard it before. And we have to be able to get these people to the place where they can hear the gospel because oftentimes one day they don't get saved and the next day know, maybe I shouldn't be doing that. So sometimes we have to be able to come and not put up with sin. There's a big difference between that. He was, Ananias wasn't like Saul. Get out there and start murdering Christians again. God doesn't care. That's not it. But he was able to go and he was able to be there for Saul before, before Saul proved that he was actually Paul. I think that matters a lot for us. I think there are people in our lives that are in that state right now where they're new Christians and they're trying to follow Christ, but quite frankly, they have no idea what they're doing. Shouldn't this be the place they can come? If they can't come to church, if they can't be around you, who's going to teach them that? If we're not willing, that'd be terrible. We can't leave them like that. And this is the hard part. Are, are you willing to reach your own personal soul? That's tough. It's one thing when you're saying, are you able to put up with somebody's sin that was sin that wasn't against me? It's another thing to say, hey, Ben, are you asking me to be willing to share the gospel with those that have hurt me personally? Are you asking me to share the gospel with my Saul, the one who destroyed my life? the one who left me with pain and left me with trauma that I'm still dealing with? Are you saying that I should still be willing to reach these people? 
yeah, that's what Ananias was asked to do. And it's one thing, isn't it, when it's sin that doesn't affect us. But we all have people in our lives that have treated us like absolute garbage. That if we are honest, we know it's wrong. But if we are honest, we're kind of like, God, it'd be sweet if you just got them. Like, I know you're merciful. I know I need your mercy. But uh, if you could just hold back on this one and let them have it, it'd be kind of fun to watch. We all have those people in our lives. They broke your heart. They hurt you. They kicked you when you were vulnerable. You gave them your trust. They destroyed it. Maybe they're your parents or your uncles or your cousins or whatever it is, your siblings, and they were supposed to be there for you, and they let you down. And so part of you is kind of like, well, forget them then. They're going to get what God has given to give them. And whatever he gives them, I'm good with. I hope it's double. Are, are we willing to reach our own personal selves? Are we, are we willing to reach the people in our lives that hurt us the most? Are we willing to be able to be there and to share with them? I was listening. I couldn't find it. I looked, I've looked so many times to try to find it. I used to go to the chapel at Cross Point years ago, back when I was in high school in the early part of college, because my parents lived up there. We lived really close to that church. Pastor Jerry, he shared his testimony one day. And he was talking about how there was this girl in high school, and he wanted nothing to do with Christianity. And this girl was always trying to share with him. And he said, I made it my personal goal to uh, make her life miserable. He's like, I did everything I could to make her life miserable. And he said, I did a pretty good job at it. And he talked about some of the things he did. We won't need to go into any of the details. And it was so long ago, I don't remember some of the details. But what stuck out to me was that there came a point in his life where he recognized that he didn't have answers about religion that he wanted. And so on a night when he was broken and he was looking for answers, guess who he picked up his phone to call? The person that he had tortured throughout high school. Because no matter how poorly he treated her, she just always was there. She always treated him in a loving way, and she was always willing to share the gospel with him. And so in his darkest moment, he picked up and he called. What if your Saul called you? And you pick up that phone and you look at the number, and you're like, what? We've given up on a lot of people. We've held things against people for a really long time. And if we can learn anything from Saul, it's that God can change anybody. And we see that and we know that. And yet sometimes we don't live like he can, right? Because in our minds we're like, yeah, anybody, but that's pretty bad. And some of us are like, yeah, anybody, but I hope not them. But God saved you, and he saved me, and we didn't deserve it. I didn't deserve his grace, no matter how good we are. The Bible says the whole basis of the Bible is that we never measure up. We all fall short of the glory of God. But when it's sin against us, it's so in our face, it's really hard to look past sometimes. And so my question for you is, would you be okay if Jesus changed your personal Saul? My thought was going through this with Saul and Stephen was uh, years later, Saul also is martyred, ironically, even though he's the one holding those coats, those cloaks saying, I value this jacket more than Stephen's life. I wonder what it was like for Stephen when one day, Saul, Paul, now we, he called Paul, he's executed, and he gets up to heaven, and Stephen's like, hey, what are you doing here? He's like, Lord, when I said forgive them, because they don't know what they were doing, you really took that seriously, right? Can you imagine that? When Stephen, he sees Saul, and there's a whole bunch of believers there, and they all are dead, and they're in heaven, because Saul put them in jail and had them executed, and all of them are like, what? Saul is here? Okay, you got to tell us this story. Right? Can you imagine? We, I, we, I never thought about that until I was going through this. I was like, I can't imagine being Stephen, and I'm just walking the streets of gold, and boom, Saul's there. And it's like, this seems weird. Like, there was a lot of people I thought I wouldn't run into, and you were at the top of the list. 
And as I thought about that, I was like, honestly, I know it's hard to get there because many of us are st still struggle with forgiveness and many of us still struggle with the hurt and scars that people left behind. But how great would it be to get to heaven and your personal Saul is there and your sins are blotted out and their sins are blotted out and both of you are looking at each other and you're looking at God and you're like, we don't deserve to be here. And in that moment, Jesus gets all the glory, doesn't he? Because we didn't do anything to get there. It was him. He rescued us. That's why it's good news. Because without him, we have nothing. And I just thought about that. Man, it would be so cool if some of the people in my life that I consider solves, if I got to heaven and they were there. And it's like, hey, tell me how, tell me how Jesus got you. Tell me the story. What a day that would be. What a day that would be. <sighs> I'm going to skip ahead a little bit because I don't want to rush communion. The last thing here was, um, we definitely have to address this, I think, is uh, a lot of people, they get saved, and, you know, and they're saying that, okay, I'm going to follow Christ. And it's not, I'm not talking about people in that short, in that period of time where they're learning what it means to follow Christ. I'm talking about Christians that have been saved for a really long time. Galatians 1.13 says this, for you have heard of my former life in Judaism. This is Paul talking about how he lived as Saul, how I persecuted the church of God violently and tried to destroy it. He's sharing this. He's saying, you know my past. And my wonder and my worry for some is that some people here, they said, I have been saved. I know Jesus. I know what he's done for me. I've been in the church for a long period of time, but they're still living like Saul. They say, I'm Paul. I've been washed new. But if you look at their life, it looks a lot like their old life. And we do that with small things, right? Because automatically, all of us, myself included, we start, making some, uh, we start making some excuses for the things that we've carried with us from our old life into our new life. And it's like, well, I only do it when I'm around some of those people because I know it won't affect them. Or, yeah, I only do it when uh, I'm by myself and I'm not really hurting anybody. Or the thing that I'm involved in, God knows me. He knows my heart. He loves me. So I guess this one thing, it's between him and I. He knows I'm struggling, and it's fine. And I thought about that. I know it's a drastic, uh, I know it's a drastic example, but what if Saul did the same thing? What if he got saved and became Paul, but on a Saturday he's like, you know what I haven't done in a while? I have not thrown any people in prison and seen them murdered. I kind of miss it. And he's like, I guess just once. I mean, I just, just this is one time. I mean, most of everything I'm doing is good. I'm preaching the gospel. I'm going into synagogues. I'm telling Jewish people. I'm trying to reach Gentiles. I'm doing what I should. But I guess this one time, this one Saturday, I guess it's fine if I go in and I throw a couple people in jail. You're like, then that seems ridiculous. I know. But isn't that kind of what we do with our lives? We take who we were before we knew Christ. And we've been following Christ. And we say, I'm a follower of Jesus. I'm a believer. I'm a Christian. But we got a lot of our old self living inside of us. And we're way too comfortable with that. It's one thing to struggle. We will never, we will never be perfect here on this earth. That will never happen. It's one thing to have things that we are struggling with. I loved how Pastor Evans always talked about it. He talked about falling forward. He's like, as we struggle, we're struggling, but we're moving in the right direction. It's just slower for some of us. Some of us hit the ground a little harder, right? And so we're struggling forward. That's one thing to be struggling forward in life, to have these things that we have these proclivities towards that we are very susceptible to, that we struggle with, and to be talking to God and communing with God and moving in the right direction. It's another thing to take, an old, to take a part of our life that we used to have and bring it with us into our current life and go, no, this is fine. Just this, just this one is okay. And so many people do that. And I thought, man, that's just a great picture of how ridiculous it is to say I was Saul and God changed me and he made me Paul, but I'm going to bring this chunk of my old life with me into this new life. And I think God's okay with it. So many people do that. We got a lot of people that are claiming to be Paul that are living a lot like Saul. 
And I, I want to finish with that because we're going to go into communion. And communion is a time for us to examine where we're at with the Lord. It's a time for us to consider the things that he's done. It's a time for us to look at ourselves and see ourselves for who we truly are. Broken people that God has called, that he has saved, that he has washed, that he has regenerated, that he has brought into this new way of life. It's time for us to be able to examine and to thank him for his death, his burial, his resurrection. The bread representing his body that was broken, that was torn apart for us. The cup representing the blood. Without blood, there is no remission, no forgiveness of sins. It's a time for us to come together and it's a time for us to individually look at our lives and corporately as a group recognize our failures, our downfalls, give that to him, commit to stepping in the right direction, but also recognizing that our sin's been paid for. Communion is a lot, isn't it? It's a special moment where we thank him for all that he has done. And so as we move forward now into communion, my question for you would be, which one of these things is, do you need to, let me see if I got them. Which one of these is important for you today? Have you counted someone out in your life? Have you thought there's no way God reaches them? Maybe you counted yourself out. A lot of people do that. We often seem to be more hard on ourselves sometimes, even than others are. Have we been unwilling to reach some because of who they are? because of their past, because of their reputation, because we know them just like Ananias knew Saul. And for some of us, are we living like our old selves? So as we now step down towards communion, if you guys who would help with communion would come forward, I want us, we're going to take a moment, and I'm going to have them pray. And then as the communion is passed out, I want, I want you to take that time to be able to talk to God about where you're at in life, about who you are, about what he's called you to be, and about the differences that he is requires of us in the way that we live when we're claiming to walk in newness of life.